Coming up on this week's show, Lucy Lennox is here to talk about her latest, Felix and the Prince. Plus, Lisa is back and she's got book recommendations. Welcome to the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for readers and writers of gay romance fiction. If you can read it, write it, watch it, or listen to it, these two guys are going to talk about it. Now, here are your hosts, Jeff Adams and Will Knauss. Welcome to episode 124 of Jeff and Will's Big Gay Fiction Podcast. I'm Jeff from jeffadamswrites.com. And I am Will from willknauss.com. This week's episode is brought to you in part by listeners... Just like you, we will have more information, as always, on how you can help support this show in just a few moments. Welcome back, everyone. We hope you had a terrific week and got some great reading done. Um, we've been busy, uh, along with the rest of the world. We've been watching some Olympics. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, what else has been going on in your life, sir? In my life? Well, <laughs> work last week was honestly some hell. Yeah, um, it was pretty bad. It was, pretty, it was a little messed up. It was a little crazy town, but that that's behind us now, which is good. <laughs> uh, there was some writing on Winger 4 that happened. Uh, on Friday, uh, the edits came in from Harmony Inc. for the first round uh, on uh, Winger 2, which is t- called Schooled. Uh, so I've been busy with that the last couple of days. Getting my commas moved around <laughs> correctly <laughs> is mostly what this first phase is about. Uh, as we all know, I apparently don't know how to use commas in the correct fashion. So Dawn moves them around for me. Thank you, Dawn, if you're listening. Appreciate it. Uh, what else went down last week? We're going to GRL. We yes, got, GRL. We got registered. GRL signups happened on Saturday. Um as we've grown to know them as the authorial Hunger Games. Um, I'm more referred to it as Comic-Con, but Hunger Games works too. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we both got in. This year, Jeff will once again be returning as a so featured, featured, featured author. I can never yes. get them straight. He's going to be there as a featured author. I am there as a, what's my title? An industry professional. Yes, I have a new title, everyone. I went from now on. You need to refer to me as Will, industry professional. Uh, I will be uh, once again at GRL representing the podcast. Also, I have been very kindly asked by the um, the organizers. Thank you. Uh, uh, it might be another week of words for me. I'm so so sorry, everyone. Um, yes, the organizers have asked me to return. Uh, apparently last year I did good enough to be asked to moderate panels once again, which I'm really happy about. Uh, I had a great time doing it last time, and I'm looking forward to doing it once more. Um, I think we're all going to have a great time in Virginia. Mm-hmm. The final list of supporting and featured authors will be coming out in the next few days once all the dust settles with the organizers. And I imagine we'll see... Also, the other industry professionals. Um, I know Joyfully Jay, Jay from Joyfully Jay, um, is in there on the blogger side of industry professionals. Uh, and there's also a segment of folks who are audiobook narrators. Uh, I know Kurt Graves is going. It'll be his first. I saw a post about that. I'm very excited to meet Kurt. Uh, so it'll be fun to see the list and how it all sorts out. How everybody got sorted into their various little mm. pockets of things. Indeed. See, it's a little bit of the sorting hat, too, from Harry mm-hmm. Potter. There's so many analogies that we could do. Uh-huh. So we also got a really nice email from a listener this week. Uh, yes, Chris, you sent us a lovely email and uh, thanked us for doing the show. He is a, um, a recent listener. Uh, he uh, just discovered the show, uh, and he has gone... Uh, he has begun his journey through our backlist titles. Uh, so uh, stay strong, stay strong, Chris. That's <laughs> I. Yeah, I don't know. I don't even go back to those old episodes. Um, yeah. Not 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 that the content isn't awesome because it actually is pretty phenomenal. Um, I uh... going back to how we were doing the show back then. We've evolved a lot in 124 weeks. I think. Well, per- for me personally, I don't know if I would say a lot. I've gotten marginally better at talking on camera. Uh, words are still, of course, very difficult for me. Anyway, Chris, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, he also mentioned uh, in his uh, quick email his love for gay romance fiction and how 
Patricia Nell Warren uh, got him reading down that particular path. Uh, mm-hmm. Patricia Nell Warren has been a essentially a gateway drug for an awful lot of us. Uh, so, yes, thank you, Chris, for your very kind words. Yes, and Chris, do your best to get your husband to come on board, too. <laughs> it's, it's lovely over here in the <laughs> yes. gay romance area. Come in, the water is fine. <laughs> Uh, we mentioned Olympics. We have been watching a lot of Olympics. The skating this week was really exceptional uh, to watch the men's uh, individual. Uh, Adam Rippon was, not only do I think he delivered excellent performances, uh, but his his passion for the Olympics and his sheer emotion on things, and him out there just being himself was, was wonderful to see. Uh, I don't know that Andrea Joyce will ever be the same after interviewing Adam because uh, he always had some very interesting quips that I think some of us are still wondering what he was trying to say in the first place. Um, and Gus Kenworthy, NBC very much embraced um, everything about Gus. He's been a face of the games. Uh, his boyfriend was there. We got to see them kiss on camera Saturday night. They did not shy away from his boisterous parents and fans who were there with the rainbow flags. Uh, he competed... Uh, not as well as he wanted. He was hurt. He broke his he broke his thumb and had a hematoma. And the poor guy just kind of got beat up in in, in uh, South Korea. But he he skis his second event, uh, qualifies on Monday, and I believe finals for that are on Wednesday. So we hope Gus can still perhaps pull out a medal. Mm-hmm. What have you thought of the Olympics so far? Um, if anything, uh, Pyeongchang uh, has proven something that we've always known is that representation matters. Um, as you said, Adam has been, um, from the very moment he stepped onto Olympic ice, he has been 100% genuine, 100% himself, uh, and I don't think he could have done it any other way. Mm -hmm. Uh, congratulations to him, although, uh, he placed 10th, uh, in the individual skate, he did go away with a bronze medal from the team competition. Yes. Um, and for all the haters who, um, it, it's so frustrating, it makes me so very mad, um, who were trashing Adam, not necessarily because he was gay, but because um, he's gotten so much media coverage, uh, despite the fact that he was never really in middle contention. They're just throwing their hands up in the air and going, why? Um, you know what? I'll tell you why. It's because, you know what? He came in 10th. Do you understand what that means? Mm. That means he is in the top, like, one-tenth of one percentile of people in his sport on the entire planet. Um, He's the very best at what he does, and he deserves all the accolades that he has received in the past week. Um, Absolutely. um, It's actually (laughs) really uh, funny and very, very endearing. Um, Celebrities have uh, (laughs) embraced Adam and his truthfulness uh let's see who uh reese Reese witherspoon Witherspoon is a fan britney spears is a fan and even recently um uh sam sally field's uh son oh uh uh, adam is his gay crush so like any good mom will do sally field is taken to social media (laughs) in order to uh arrange something (laughs) for sam and adam it's utterly hilarious and uh absolutely wonderful uh, so kudos to everything that Adam has accomplished. Um, also, uh, what Gus has uh, been able to accomplish in his time in Korea, um, like you said, he is essentially uh, one of the important faces of the games. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's the wonderful uh, Olympic mom commercial that he did with his mom. There is the incredibly sexy head and shoulders shower commercial where he waves, literally waves the rainbow flag in that commercial. Yeah. Uh, and like you said, uh, it's... I don't think there are really any words. I think you could actually literally do a sociology dissertation on what representation has yeah. meant from these two remarkable uh, American athletes. They're incredible. One of the things that I've loved hearing about Adam's social media, um, and it seems a little silly on the surface, but Elmo mm-hmm. tweeted at him. <laughs> Elmo's official you know, <laughs> Sesame Street Children's Television Workshop uh, Twitter account <laughs> tweeted at Adam, uh, mentioned that he's Elmo's friend, and wished him all the best. And that kind of representation where young people can see Elmo 
calling out Adam, who might be like them, mm-hmm. um, is so important. And frankly, for the people who hate that, I love that Elmo did that <laughs> because you know it just pisses them off that this character that their kids watch on Sesame Street could even possibly, oh my God, do such a thing. So I like that. I like the, the what it sends to the kids and I like that it just jabs at the hater parents. So there's my take on that. Mm-hmm. Go Elmo. Mm-hmm. So an interesting thing that came out this week is called Book to Pod. And this is a new service that allows authors to uh, choose to upload their books to this service, have them turned into text to speech, and have it all sliced and diced up into some very nice podcast episodes. So it's essentially an audiobook that the computer is reading that breaks itself up into how many ep- ever episodes, whether they're broken by chapter or by scene. That's up to the author, how the book is sliced up. It gets professionally produced with music and artwork, and it can be hosted. And at the end of the day, you end up with all these audio files that, even if you choose a hosted solution, only cost about $1,000, which is far less than most audiobook production would turn out to be. They seem to be very careful to not indicate that this is a replacement for an audiobook, as it does make podcast episodes, which you're most likely, as an author, going to distribute for free. Uh, We've sampled the voices. Uh, I've actually put through the test drive function uh, 1,300 characters, which is a really tiny portion of a page, uh, of my book, Dancing for Him. I'm going to put this up on the show notes page uh, of of this week's episode and invite everyone to go take a listen. I deliberately tried to find a piece of the story where the 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 main characters uh, feeling some thoughts about this guy that he's looking at, and where there's a little bit of dialogue to kind of piece together how this would how you might think it would work if it was an audiobook. Uh, and we'd really like to hear from you, our lovely audience, what you would think of listening to a book with a computer generated voice. Uh, it's very much like if you have your, uh, at least if for those of you who have Macs, have your Mac read something to, to you off the screen. Um, it's an interesting concept uh, to get work out there for free. It's a good discoverability channel. It seems like it'd be a good channel for a lot of things. Uh, what was your take on on this announcement? And would you listen to a book this way uh, if you could also read it? Because I know you read along with your audios. I think Book to Pod is actually a really interesting concept um, and I think it's a, a frankly a very interesting opportunity for authors it's a really terrific um, discoverability tool uh, it's another way to get your work out there so I am a hundred percent all for that I would like to save our thoughts for what we think of this particular audio sample until we hear back from you our listeners so please go to the show notes page for this episode listen to the sample of Jeff's book dancing for him and then uh, drop us a note give us a comment and tell us what you think if you would listen to an entire book read by a computer yeah and have it split up over podcast episodes Mm -hmm. so you may not be able to binge it depending on how the author chose to release it Mm -hmm. let us know we really want to hear from you 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 Speaking of you, our wonderful listeners, I want to take a quick moment to mention Patreon. Now, you can help support the Big Gay Fiction Podcast with a monthly pledge through Patreon for as little as 25%. 25%? What? What am I talking about? (laughs) As little as 25 cents an episode. Your pledge helps pay for the cost of producing and distributing this show. Now, for fans who pledge at the silver and gold levels, you have the exclusive opportunity to ask questions of our upcoming guests. And as always, you also have the option to have a personalized thank you sent directly to you, our valuable, uh, valued patrons. Yes. Yes. So now any month that we have pledges that cover our monthly production costs, we will produce a special bonus episode. Now, as we recently mentioned, we're going to be moving in the month of March. So uh, the bonus episode for March will be put on hold. We're going to come up with something uh, at a later date. Um, to kind of fill that gap. Something special. There will be something special to make up for our move month. Yes. So, no, as always, uh, to learn more, all you need to do is go to patreon.com slash biggayfictionpodcast. That is p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash biggayfictionpodcast. Yes. Now, this past week, I got to talk to Lisa from The Novel Approach, mm-hmm. and we have some great book recommendations from her. So check this out. I'm very happy to welcome back Lisa from The Novel Approach. Welcome, Lisa. How are you? 
Thank you. It's great to be here. I'm doing great. Doing great. Excellent. So February, Valentine's Month, great month to talk about all kinds of, of good romancy stuff and books to read. I know you've got three to talk to us about this month. What have you got for us? Uh, you know, I will go ahead and start off um, with the one that I'm in the middle of right now, which is uh, Andrea Speed's Infected Throwaways. Um, I, I think that I've maybe touched on this this verse before uh, in previous podcasts, but it is a it's an urban fantasy um, set in Seattle, Washington, and it, the original the original Infected series. Uh, came out, oh my gosh, I want to say like in 2010 or something. So this is a series that Andrea has been writing, a, a universe that Andrea has been writing in in a long time, uh, for a long time. So we had uh, in, in the original uh, Infected series, was centered a lot around uh, the, the, the paranormal um, shifters in, in, in the air in this verse, but it was also all wrapped around in a variety of mysteries. Roan uh, is a lion shifter, the only one of his kind. He was born uh, born with the virus as opposed to having been infected by it. And so he is a private investigator, ex-cop, and, and uh, so she gets real involved, Andrea gets real involved with all of the mysteries and everything. And uh, Roan ends up with um, sort of a sidekick of sorts in, in uh, uh, Holden Krauss, who is um, this real, just, he's, he was a street kid turned prostitute, just a, a real, um, uh, just a real kind of disaffected sort of character, just a, a real uh, kind of hard edged, you know, um, but he ends up inheriting Roan's private detective business when uh, Andrea ended the first the first part of the infected series. So so now this is carrying on with with Holden who has become sort of a vigilante of sorts handing out justice to um, you know in a batmanish kind of way. He's got no superpowers uh, to speak of uh, other than the fact that he's just a real uh, he, can I say badass? Can I, is that okay? Okay, he's just a real badass kind of guy, and so he just goes and meets out the the sort of justice for the 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 people who are defenseless, who can't fend for themselves, and and so uh, infected throwaways is is the second book in Holden's. Uh, series, and I'm kind of getting into the meat of the, the mystery now. Um, this is less, this particular portion of the series is less focused on the the shifters. They're still there, obviously, but it's less focused because Holden does not have that, you know, does not have the virus. So, so we're getting into the meat of the mystery right now, and it, it's just really, uh, it's interesting to read this the stories from Holden's point of view because he is this kind of disaffected, couldn't, you know, kind of almost he cares, but he almost doesn't care. You know, it, 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 he cares about the things that he cares about and everybody else can just go to hell. So, uh, you know, that's kind of the way he is. So, uh, it's just, it's a really, it's really nice now to be getting his point of view and, and to get to know him a little more. He's got this past, you know, a history that, that has just kind of shaped who he is and, and how he became how he is. And so, so Andrea Speed's Infected Throwaways is, it, it comes out, um, it comes out, I, I, I hate to say next week because it's, you know, it comes out, but it does come out next week from the day of this recording. Um, so, so yeah, it should be out by the time the podcast goes live and, and, uh, yeah, I highly recommend the entire series from Infected Prey book one all the way through now to to Infected Throwaways. This is just a really great universe that Andrea has created, and she's got a great writing voice. Uh, just really captures every like little nuance in, in, in building not only this alternate Seattle, but in building the characters and their relationships and how they interact with each other and interact with, you know, Seattle around them. And so it's, it's a great, great series. Highly recommend it. Excellent. And I still want to read these from the first time you talked about them because it sounds like a really fun read. 
uh, to kind really, of get into it, that urban fantasy. And I've been getting, I've been veering more towards that a little bit. So. Yeah. Well, and these aren't necessarily, there's, there, you know, they're, they're not a uh, romance novels. They are pure urban fantasy with, with, romantic relationships, you know, uh, uh, between, you know, Roan and his, his first husband. And, and I don't want to give anything away, you know, but, uh, Andrea has not pulled, has not pulled the, the God in the machine, you know, when she, she, she made this universe, she committed to it knowing that some of the things that happen are going to be really, really painful for her readers, but she's mm -hmm. just, she's, she's stuck to it. And, and so there is, the not the focus on the romance but there's so much you know love between with Roan and his husband and then you know it, it's just it's really neat it's just really neat so Excellent. yeah fun series fun series and in a similar vein i know you've also got uh, jordan castile price's latest psychop book to talk about as well yeah yes oh my gosh that this series i didn't come across the series until like 2010 um, but she started writing this series back in 2006. So she's, she's committed herself to these characters for the last 12 years. Um, and, and this, this verse that she's created and it is just absolutely spectacular. Just really, um, it's, a, again, it's a paranormal alternate universe spec fic Chicago. Victor Bain, uh, is, is a medium. And he is, he is like a high level, like within this, this psych world, he is, he is a medium above all mediums. Like he's so talented that they, they can't even measure him. No one has measured him because he is just unlike any other medium in, in, in this verse. So he started out as a Chicago police officer um, in the psychop division. And so every every psychop also has a stiff who is a non psych person, you know, a partner. So uh, he, you know, again, it's it's really involved around uh, the murders that occur and and Vic's encounters with the ghosts of the murder victims and them trying to to track down the killers. And uh, in the midst of it all. Uh, you learn all, again all of this backstory about about Vic and and uh, his time in a place that is called Camp Hell, which is basically you know where they were studied. He was basically just a like a you know a lab rat or something. You know they they test and they they studied and it and the, the kind of emotional scars that this left on him with it during his time there and and he, he ends up. Uh, meeting and falling in love with, uh, Jacob Marks, who is, is not, uh, he, he does not have a specific talent, but he does have a talent that is eventually revealed. So, so this is, uh, this, the Psychop series, the series is just, uh, it's in, like I said, it's involved and, and JCP has just really created from, from the ground up this, this universe where you've got different levels of, of psych talents and, and the, the murders and the, just the ritual. And, and then that, you know, on top of it is again, this, it, it, these books aren't what it, what I would call romances, but you've got this very, very kind of deep and fulfilling relationship with Vic and, and Jacob that has grown, um, over, over the years. And she, you know, I, I said in agent Bain book nine, which is the one that just came out in January, the latest one is that, you, you know, sh the author completely disappears into her character. I mean, I can imagine Victor Bain sitting down at his computer and typing out these novels, you know, that's, that's how well she knows him and how, how clear his voice is in, in this series. They're just spectacular, spectacular. So Psychop series, Agent Bane, book nine, just came out in January. Phenomenal, phenomenal series. Don't feel bad about starting in 2010. I just read my, I just read Psychop one in January. So. <laughs> Yeah, so you've got some catching up to do. You have I do. Some catching up to do. Yeah, yeah, but uh, you know, it, it's it's yeah. The commitment 
the commitment to that, the, this, you know, 12 years now of being in this character's head, I respect that commitment so much. And the fact that, that it hasn't gone stale, that she just brings something fresh and new every single book. And, and, you know, it, it just, this is a series that I just, I'm going to be so sad when it ends. I just don't want it to end because, you know, I guess I'll just have to go back and read them all again. <laughs> Because it just, you know, it just seems like every, the, just the nuances of everything that has grown and built from book one, and you will see this as you continue on, is just incredible, incredible mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. And I think your last one, you're going to actually take us to, to King Arthur's uh, court, if you will. <laughs> I am. I am. Um, Harper Fox who is one of my uh, one of my favorite authors uh she also has a, a mystery series the tyak and frain series that is now eight books in i think um that is just unbelievable but she has started a trilogy an arthurian legends trilogy king arthur lancelot uh guinevere merlin um and it's it, it is it, Two books in now, the, the second book, uh, Dragon's Tale, was just released recently, and it is it is really, really uh, incredible fantasy. Um, you know, I don't, I, I think that pretty much what I know about Arthur was learned in Holy Grail, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, you know? <laughs> I mean, I know just the Hollywoodized, you know, versions uh, and all the iterations that have come out through through various movies. I know about, you know, King Arthur and the Round Table and the Knights of the Round Table and the Search of the Holy Grail and, and uh, the Lancelot Guinevere affair. And, I, you know, I know the very basics of it. But when you're reading this, these books, Arthur Fox, again, she writes with such an authoritative voice that you, you know, I don't, you know, I don't even question the veracity of what she's written because I, she just writes it in such a way. And, and all the little, the little subtle details woven in like, uh, like old King Cole, you know, the nursery rhyme of old King Cole. And she's got, you know, old King Cole as a character in the second book. And, and so it's just, it, it's real interesting. Um, you know, of course, Arthur and, and Lancelot have, have their relationship, but now Guinevere was just, uh, introduced in this last book in such a way that made me go, what? Because it was so creative and so neat. So, um, I, I'm real interested to see how this trilogy is going to end. And I believe that the next one comes out, if I'm not mistaken, in March. So we don't have too long to wait for the for the third book in the trilogy, but uh, it, it's just really stunning. She has such a way of of painting word pictures. So you're you're reading and you're picturing all of these the scenes and and everything the the you know dragons and everything in your imagination. And she just has such a great way of of writing to evoke you know, the senses in more than in, in, you know, more than just your sight of the words on the page. She just really has this, this way of, of, of painting word pictures to the point where you feel like you're kind of just immersed. And the next thing you know, you look up and you go, oh gosh, yeah, here, I'm in the real world. You know, after, after you feel like you've been, you know, traveling through medieval England. So it's, it's very cool. So Harper Fox's Arthur, uh, the Legends of Arthur trilogy is, is amazing. Yeah. I'm gonna have to look that up because one of my favorite movies is Excalibur from yeah somewhere well, in the '80s. I think it was maybe yeah. even early '80s, and that that was kind of like my big introduction to King Arthur and everything. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And I played uh, D and D for years, so yeah. I love some medieval stuff. So exactly, I'm glad you brought exactly. this one up. That, yeah, well, you know, and and the, the, there's such a there's such a romance about the legends just themselves, you know, of, of the, the knights in shining armor slaying, you know, it, it's just, it's, it's such a, such a great, uh, uh, mythology to have, you know, uh, to be able to kind of riff off of and put your own stamp on. And, and so that's kind of what she's doing is just putting, putting her own, her own stamp on, on those legends. And it's, it's really brilliant. Just beautiful. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for bringing these three books to us. Uh, and we will look to have you here again in a couple of months to give us some good spring reads. 
Yes, that sounds great. I've got some that I'm looking forward to that are going to be coming out by then. So yeah, excellent. In the Hockey Player's Heart, the feel-good gay romance by Jeff Adams and Will Knauss, hockey star Caleb Carter returns to his hometown to recover from an injury. He never expects to run into his one-time crush at a grade school fundraiser. Seeing Aaron Price hits him hard, like being checked into the boards. The attraction is still there, even after all these years, and Caleb decides to make a play for the school teacher. You miss 100% of the shots you never take, right? Aaron has been burned by love before, and can't imagine what a celebrity like Caleb could possibly see in a guy like him. Their differences are just too great, but as Aaron spends more time with Caleb, he begins to wonder if he might have what it takes to win the hockey player's heart. Get the hockey player's heart at dreamspinnerpress.com, amazon.com, and other online book retailers. And here we are once again at the book recommendation and review portion of our show. Jeff, you have been doing some reading. A little bit. <laughs> um, I've been reading the Heart to Heart anthology that came out last week, uh, featuring a dozen of authors, including some of our very favorite folks. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is a completely delightful collection. Uh, as we know from our talk with Lucy Lennox a couple weeks ago, uh, this centers around a dating app that... Hasn't exactly goes wrong. <laughs> that goes awry, <laughs> um, and sets up some wildly uh, crazy couples uh, who you would not expect. These are all about really opposite attract stories. Uh, there's the the book starts out uh, with uh, an interlude from Lucy herself, uh, which tells us how this went so amuck because Bentley, the programmer, has been distracted by Ryder, the window washer, and decides that the app is good enough. And they go off and have their little moment, leaving everybody else to kind of fend for themselves as the app launches over Valentine's Day. Now, some of my, frankly, all the stories here are utter delights. They're little nuggets of just the best things of these individual couples getting together and sticking it out through those moments of like, why am I with this person? How did this just happen? Uh, and then getting to some really good, uh, either usually happy for now, let's just be serious. These are almost all first date stories, uh, maybe getting into the second date. So you don't know that you can project forever, but at least as these stories end, all of these people are in a really good spot to call out a few of my favorites, which include, uh, Lucy's, uh, opening interlude. And then the bat, the aftermath of what happens to Bailey after all this goes awry. Um, Chris Owens, the criminal and the sommelier. Uh, you can just imagine how all that fits together. Uh, but really, two things I loved here uh, was Felipe uh, kind of diving into Angelo's past and just falling down an internet rabbit hole of finding out who this guy is, what his past is, and the crimes he may or may not have committed, and the fan clubs that he has. Uh, really good stuff there. And how Angelo kind of nudged him into embracing adventure was also just a darling bit of the story. Uh, Haley Turner's The Superhero and the NSA Agent. Um, this The story's epilogue here just melted my heart. Uh, and just, it was, aww, all the feels. Uh, and The Event Platter and the Electrician by Poppy Dennison. Uh, this is one of those where you can just, you know, just the title itself tells you you've got this party planner with the stereotypes that go with a party planner that get planted in your head and the, the very blue collar electrician that gets planted in your head. And then Poppy just turns all this into some awesomeness as these two get together. Uh, and there's a May December aspect in this story too that was really delightful as I've been gravitating in some ways more towards May December, possibly as I myself approach 50. So <laughs> that all really worked for me. Um, Remember that this anthology is benefiting some really great charities, including the Trevor Project. Uh, it's highly worth, I think, for you to go pick it up, whether you buy it on Amazon straight out or you read it as part of your Kindle Unlimited subscription, if you have one. All the proceeds go to, to three great charities. Go pick this up before it goes away, because it is limited time, and I don't think any of us know when that time is. They could just turn it off whenever they want. So give some money to some great charities and read some awesome stories. Mm-hmm. The Heart to Heart Anthology, pick it up today 
Uh, also, we want to talk about Felix and the Prince. This is the second book in Lucy Lennox's brand new series. Um, as you can tell from the title, Felix and the Prince is an undercover prince story. So if that is your particular uh, reader catnip, uh, we both highly recommend this story. It's oh yeah, freaking awesome. And even even if secret prince stories aren't your thing, uh, still you know check this book out. It's really damn good. We uh, essentially listened to this book in its entirety on our trips back and forth to Sacramento when we were doing some house hunting. Uh, a quick shout out to Michael Polly who read this particular book. Mm -hmm. uh, he actually reads, I believe. All of Lucy's books. Uh, I think so. He's a remarkable talent and uh, did a terrific job on this particular book. So, really quickly, we want to cover what uh, Felix and the Prince is all about. It's about a nice guy named Felix. He is working on his dissertation about stained glass, which seems like utterly random and out of nowhere, <laughs> but he is really passionate about stained glass. So, what he does is he goes to this legendary castle, uh, Gadley Castle, um, it's famous for its stained glass. It's sort of like out there in the middle of nowhere. Like I believe it's like in the middle of the North Sea. I think so. Um, so he goes to this castle to specifically study its stained glass, and he ends up at the uh, sharing sharing his time there with a a prickly um, representative of the government, a guy named Lior. And of course, they kind of, they butt heads at first. Uh, but then they end up butting other things. Um, <laughs> well done. <laughs> Sorry, that was really, really, really bad. Um, uh, of course, um, they sort of start out uh, as an enemies to lovers scenario. But uh, once they spend a little more time together, they realize there's something more there. And they, of course, are really into one another. And then um, doing uh, an unfortunate... Um, breach and security protocol, Felix finds out that Lior is not just a representative of the government. He is the soon-to-be king of Monaco. He is the government. <laughs> <laughs> um, and things go a little bonkers from there. Um, this book is really exceptional. Um, I highly recommend it. I will probably say we recommend it several more times before I finish talking about Felix and the Prince. I think... Um, and the the sort of discovery that Lior is a prince is really only actually the halfway point of the book. There's like a whole lot of other um, complications that go on, mm -hmm. things that deal with each of their you know background, whether Lior is actually going to um, ex accept because of a, a family um, scandal. Uh, he's being forced into the throne, and there's a question if he even really wants to do that, uh, and whether he wants to be an out and proud king of country. Uh, also, there's the problem that Felix has with um, a perfectly legitimate reason for being um, skittish, uh, a being in the public eye, uh, in what you know, dating a king, <laughs> what that might entail. Um, so there's a lot of stuff for them to work through. Um, and I think what this particular book does is it takes two essentially normal people, even though one of them is a prince. Um, they're, they're two very real, genuine people, and it throws them into a really strange, over-the-top situation. But I think what the book uh, excels is that is that we understand their journey mm -hmm. uh, and how they explore the difficulties uh, and their and their path to uh, true love. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I what I love so much about this book is how we get each of their backstories mm -hmm. told really well um, and not info dumpy. It just naturally, organically, kind of plays its way out as it would in any relationship. Um, and also both characters really grow. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. Felix is, you know, very much the scholarly wants to be in the corner sort of, of person. And Felix draws him out. 
and as they get to know each other, uh, Felix draws Leo out and helps him discover, I think, really who who he can be as a king mm-hmm. and h- how he could be true to himself and be a king at the same time. Um, I, I loved everything about this book. Um, one of the best I've read in 2018 for sure. And 2018 is only like six weeks in, but <laughs> you know, going even further back, the way that yeah. Lucy has built this book, it's just, it's an extraordinary romance. And yet for as long as it is and as, many stories that it has, it comes all back to that very heart-filled, this could be a Hallmark movie in a lot of ways with the secret prince and the the commoner, if you will, who falls for the prince and then finds a way to be with the prince. It just, it hit every button of something that I like mm-hmm. uh, in that kind of just feel good, you know it's all going to work out in the end kind of way. And Good job, Lucy. Make more like this. Exceptional job, yes. Yeah. Now, we, of course, recently spoke to Lucy about the Heart to Heart anthology. Um, after that interview, we talked to her a little bit about Felix and the Prince uh, and some of her, you know, her other series mm-hmm. and her and, writing process. And, and of course, where the Wild books are yes. going to go, because this is only book two in the Wild series. Yeah. So, Lucy, uh, Jeff and I recently finished Felix and the Prince. Uh, loved it to pieces, and we wanted to talk to you a few minutes about sort of the origin of this particular series. Um, You had an incredibly successful series uh, that you wrapped up not too long ago. Um, What made you jump into um, this particular setting and um, uh, sort of family of characters? Um, That's a really good question. I actually, when the Marion, I I don't I don't say that the Maid Marian series is really over um, because there are a lot of things that I still want to do with it. But obviously we ran through the brothers that were available, our six brothers that were available. And so after that, I actually had lots of different ideas for new series that were based on. One was based on a group of friends from college who started a technology company together and the technology company hit it big and where all of them ended up and their stories. Um, And I couldn't quite get that where I wanted it. I started a couple of books in that series and I just, it wasn't feeling right. And then I thought I was going to write a bodyguard series and I started that and that wasn't quite working right. So I started thinking about, okay, if you take away, if you try and get back into that mindset that you were in before you ever published your first book of writing just for you, writing the book that you want to write, regardless of what the market wants, regardless of what judgment you might get, what would you really want to write? And I wanted to write another family. Um, the problem is you get judged when you write a family full of gay men because it's unrealistic. I mean, it is unrealistic. And I put that in the beginning of the first book of the series. It's like, this is dedicated to all of you who are willing to put up with me for doing this because I know it's unrealistic, but what if it wasn't, you know, what if, what if, you know, the heteronormative world it allows us to have these default huge families full of really interesting characters. And it's not fair that we don't also get those big families full of characters, you know, in the LGBT community. So it's that, so it was a wish of mine, you know, to be able to explore that some more. And um, I loved that family aspect to the Maid Marian series. And I wanted to capture some of that magic again, but I wanted to do it in a little bit of a different way. So Having said that, obviously I didn't do it in a complete vacuum of not having feedback from my first series because so much of what people loved about Maid Marian series was the family, the large family, um, the silliness that comes from a large crazy family. But also a lot of people loved the old ladies, you know, the silly old lady trio. And I never really intended for them to be such a big part of the series and I never really intended them to be quite so raunchy. Um, but you know, some characters just do what they want to do regardless of what the author plans. Um, so I didn't really want to have that same thing. You know, I didn't want to take a, try and recreate the Aunt Tilly trio in the new series, but I did want to explore some of the more serious, um, reactions that came out of having that group, especially Granny and Irene, who were, you know, a senior citizen couple, a gay couple who um, were 
I, I found it fascinating to, and I'm going to come back around to my point here in a minute, but I found it fascinating that um, thinking about when you look at the, the long lifespan of a gay couple by the time they get to the ages that we're talking about and how many different periods in our time, in our culture's time they've lived through. Um, I mean, obviously you have the AIDS epidemic you have for, for grandpa and doc who I've introduced in this new series, it, it goes back to, they were born in the forties. No, they were born in the thirties and forties. And so there's so much history, so much of how they live their life in regards to their sexuality has had to change over all of these decades as our culture has changed, as our government has changed, as the country's perceptions have changed. And I, I realized that I wanted to explore that a little bit more. So not the humor side of having this um, older couple who's gay, but the, the emotional side of it, the challenges, the, the coming to terms with how society is shifting, even though the two of you have been in your relationship for a long time. Um, so having said that, when I started this new series, this patriarch couple sort of appeared um, with Grandpa and Doc. And I realized that I have a huge family, but Grandpa and Doc are at the top of it. And so I'm really looking forward to writing their story story as well. So they take a big role in each of the books in terms of being, and you guys and I talked before the interview started about um, Grandpa and Doc being sort of the mentor to this younger generation, not only showing them you, the 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 courage to live out loud, the courage to be with who you want to be with, but also um, that steadfast, committed relationship that some of the, some of the wild kids don't have that, like Felix specifically, didn't have parents who were married and committed. Um, but he ended up getting raised by Doc and Grandpa, who were that very sort of traditional, I mean, you know, Grandpa was a rancher and Doc was a doctor and they live in a small town and they lived on their ranch and in a farmhouse and with a big kitchen and family dinner and making chili and all of these things. So that's kind of what I wanted to explore. Um, so having said that, though, I love tropes. I'm a super tropey reader. Um, I love uh, seeing you could just see um, the, the book I always use and is an example is as an example is a book called um, on the Island, I think. And it's an MF contemporary romance was stranded on a deserted Island. Okay. And there's an age difference, which is not usually my thing, but in that one. Um, and so I read it a few years ago and I remember talking to my sister, who's also an author about it at the time. And she said, yeah, give me any stranded on a deserted Island. One click. I don't need to read the blurb. I don't, I don't need to know about the characters. You, you just, just tell me there's, there's a couple stranded on a deserted island and I want it. Will and, is all about forced proximity. <laughs> yes. Yes. And enemies to lovers, like you name it. Like for me, stranded in a cabin in Alaska was a big one for me. Um, a, a, an airplane crash would also be a big, which I've tried. I've started one of those. They're harder than they look um, to write. But um, The Martian also, which I posted about recently. I love The Martian, the book and the movie. And my sister and I were like, you could write 10 more Martians with different versions of Mark Watley's challenges and we'd read it. So I'm really drawn to those. And so that's where Felix's book came from, the royal, because the MF contemporary romance can go to town on a royal, hidden royal stories. You, you know, oh, I've always wanted my prince, but we don't have a ton of that in, in gay romance at all yet. I mean, there are definitely some. Um, so I decided sort of midway through last year, I definitely wanted to write a royal story and I wrote it. And right before it came out, of course, the Prince Harry and Meghan um, Merkel got engaged. So that was great timing for me because it brought, you know, got everybody excited about it again. Um, and I know that um, Riley Hart and is it Riley and Christina together have a prince? Um, I hope I'm not getting that wrong. Um, have a prince book coming out. And I know there are a couple of other people. So it's 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 going to be really exciting because. They're, they're evergreen tropes. I mean, it's, we're always going to love those stories, but right now it's particularly exciting, I think. Um, so that's how I decided to write the Royal Romance. And then Facing West, the first book in the series, um, I knew from Maid Marian 
of all of the side characters that came out of Maid Marian, the one I, I wanted to tell this, his story was Nico, Griff's best friend from Grounding Griffin. And I didn't know what his story was. Um, but when I started thinking about why he ended up on the streets, which is how he met Griff, I had to figure out how he ended up on the streets. And that's where I sort of went into his story. So it's not really, I mean, I guess you could consider it a spinoff, the Forever Wild series of the Maid Marian series, but you don't have to have read Maid Marian at all. Um, and I try and write each book so that you don't have to have read any of the previous books. Yeah, um, so, so for far, sure, Felix, yeah. So far for Felix, because he's, he's got book one in progress. I haven't read book one, and I'm having no issue with Felix at all. That, was, yeah. that just took off and went. I'm so yeah. excited you said you're going to write the, the story of, of Grandpa and Doc. Um, at some point because yes. I, I, I'm interested in where that is. And I don't think we see that mm -hmm. a lot in gay mm -hmm. romance where you'd get the story of how these two men now who are, who are, you know, senior citizens started. So I, I can't mm -hmm. wait to see that. Well, I'm really excited. I know what the story is in my head and I'm really excited to write it because I've, I've, I've had several readers email me speculating, or I've even had a reader emailing saying, this can't be right. You know, someone's like, they, they can't have these children like that. That just wouldn't. And I'm like, you don't, you don't know yet. Just give me some time to tell their story. And then you'll learn how this all came to be with this family. Um, a bit of it in, um, in fact, it might've been in the scene. I can't remember. It might've been in the scene you guys were talking about earlier um, where grandpa um, I think it's grandpa explains a little bit of how, um, their doc's children, um, doc had a wife and, um, but I, I can't wait to tell their story, but that story is going to take some work on my part. Um, I think one of the challenges for me to write grandpa and doc's story is that my voice is very, I don't know what the right word is colloquial or slang. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big F bomb dropper. Um, I used a lot of just you know, current language in my voice. And I, that's not going to play if you're, you know, writing a, a story that's taking place in the sixties or fifties or seventies and these different eras and doc and grandpa's past. So that's, it's definitely going to be, um, a labor of love for me to get that story out and make sure that it's right before I release it. But I'm really excited. And I get asked about it all the time. I'm, I'm kind of curious about the setting for Felix and the Prince. Um, the first book in the Wild series is um, essentially it's a small town romance uh, for the most part. Um, but then uh, Felix and the Prince is set on, you know, the other side of the world in this castle in the middle of nowhere. And then they're surrounded by stained glass. <laughs> um, it, it's that all, almost like a... Uh, a gothic fairy tale that they're like living right in the middle of. So I was wondering if, if what were your thoughts about setting two books in the same series, like in two, you know, incredibly different places? Mm -hmm. um, that's a really good question because when I started the forever wild series, I really thought that it was going to be, set in this small town for the most part some of the siblings live in Dallas and so I knew that if I wanted a more urban you know which if you know like for instance if I wanted to write the CEO and his assistant type setup that might need to be something that happened in a bigger city um, so I had Dallas there for that you know Hobie's close enough but when you write a hidden royal story you either have to um, have the royal come, which we've read plenty and seen movies where the royal comes and you don't recognize them and they're in this tiny town. And um, But when Felix sort of revealed himself to me as a character at the end of Facing West, he was this shy academic sitting in the corner of Doc and Grandpa's kitchen. And, um, and he, the character that I wanted to pit against a prince would be to, to create the conflict as a character who couldn't be in view of the paparazzi for some reason, because the prince is all paparazzi. And so in order to keep them apart, I needed a reason why. Otherwise, you fall in love with the prince and you live happily ever after. Yay! Nobody wants to read that book. So I needed it to be somebody who was like, I can't do that. I, I love you to death, but I can't live in view of the paparazzi. And so what would cause him to be that way? And number one, he's super shy. He's an academic. But then we find out that his mother is this sort of selfish, 
megastar who abandoned him to pursue her Hollywood career and sort of trots him out whenever she has a movie release because it makes her seem a little bit more approachable to the media maybe. And so, um, so that's when I realized that, wow, if he is in the process of running away, actively running away from the paparazzi when he meets the prince, that sets up that conflict because he's hiding in his academic, in a real world version of one of his textbooks and by going to that castle in pursuit of the stained glass knowledge. And, um, and so he can have this little temporary fairy tale while he's there, but then what happens? And, um, obviously there's so many issues involved in the idea of a gay king that, you know, I, I could have written a whole nother book more about much more about that. Um, but again, those are some of the decisions that you have to make along the way when you remind yourself, okay, I'm not writing a treatise about gay royalty. I'm writing a romance novel, and this story is about these two people. And, um, But yeah, I mean, the stained glass thing, I can't even remember where that – I wanted him to be super geeky, something really um, archaic almost that like – that not only was his nose in a textbook, but they were dusty old textbooks, like not – not on a computer, but that he was like in, in a cubicle in the back of some ancient library studying something archaic. And, um, for some reason, stained glass came, came up in my head. And that's when I thought, okay, that's the perfect combination to get him to a castle. And then the other thing to answer your question is when you think about writing a tropey romance, you've got to deliver on the promise of that trope. So you have a Royal romance. Well, there's certain scenes you want to see in a Royal romance. You want to see them having to learn etiquette. Um, and I, I didn't quite get as much of that in there as I wanted. You want to see the coronation or the big ball, especially if in a gay romance, how, how are you going to have that big ball moment where they can't dance together in front of everybody? Um, but that's another big scene, you know, the promise and the, the makeover scene. That's another, you know, where the prince, the princess gets, you know, the everyday girl gets fitted for the gown, you know? And so to do that in this kind of story, there's certain scenes you want to see. And to me, a hidden room in a castle was one of those scenes. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so good. We love Felix and the Prince so much. Um, uh, we highly recommend everyone check it out. Um, okay. So, of course, the next question I'm going to ask is, when is the next wild book coming out? <laughs> good question. Uh, well, I would be remiss if I didn't mention Body and Soul. My next release with Sloan Kennedy comes out um, very soon. Um, the official release date is Tuesday, but um, we may push the button a little early um, because we have the anthology coming out on Wednesday also. Um, and then I have already started writing Otto's story. Otto is the firefighter. He has, we, we meet him in Felix and the Prince. Um, I think there's reference to him in Facing West, just sort of, oh yeah, my brother Otto and Saint are in the military. But, um, but Otto's story is a childhood best friends um, story um, that was heavily inspired by um, Leslie Copeland, my beloved beta reader. Um, she heard a song that was about childhood best friends turned soulmates. And she said, you've got to write a story like this. Um, so, um, basically I'm writing it right now and I'm hoping to release it in mid-March, but I have learned not to make promises because you never know how the book is going to come out. Um, I wrote Delivering Dante last year. It came out in early May and I wrote it and wasn't, I wrote the whole book, wasn't happy with it, tried to fix it, revised it, spent a lot of time on it, still wasn't happy with it, sent it to Leslie to beta read, had my sister read it. Both of them were like, yeah, it's fine. I'm like, yeah, it's fine thing. And started from scratch and wrote the whole thing again. So you never know when that's going to happen. And at the pace that we go with self-publishing, um, I mean, I published 10 books in my first year of publishing. And that is a, a, just a crazy pace. And so it, I can give you, you know, like a mid-March. I hope mid-March. If it goes well, if all goes well, mid-March. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Whenever it comes out. So if Otto and Walker speak to me. If Otto and Walker speak to me. So far it's going well. Fantastic. Good to hear. Well, yeah. thank you, Lucy, for joining us on the show uh, and, and filling us in on this fantastic new series. Awesome. Thank you. 
So again, thanks to Lucy for spending some time with us and talking to us about Felix and the Prince. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing what she does with uh, the grandfathers. Uh, she talked a little bit about that in the interview, and I, I hope she does something great uh, to tell their story. I really look forward to that uh, book in particular. Mm -hmm, definitely. So, guys, I think that'll do it for this week's episode. We hope you will come back and join us next week for episode 125. Poppy Dennison is penciled in. She's on the schedule, and she's going to come talk about her brand new series, The Bartlett Boys. Also, she's going to give us the down low, hopefully, on... yeah. Coastal Magic. Coastal um, Magic. It's here once again. Depending on when we talk to her, yeah. uh, she may be coming to us live from Coastal Magic. Yes, so we'll see. Tune, tune in and, s and see what happens. We don't even know. That's right. It's a mystery <laughs> right now. <laughs> so, guys, remember, no matter where life takes you, the journey will always be sweeter when you have a book. Until next time, please keep turning those pages and keep reading. For detailed show notes and the complete episode backlist, go to BigGayFictionPodcast.com. New episodes are available every Monday on all major podcast distributors and YouTube. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. 